chain to break every chain break every chain break every
gracious Heavenly Father, thank you for an opportunity to worship you this morning, to wake up and to simply focus on you this morning, God. As the song says, help us just to praise you. Praise you in all that we do. Praise you in serving others. Praise you with each breath that you provide us with. We thank you for that, God. And help us just to um, show our small token of appreciation by praising you in everything that we do, Lord. Continue to be with the prayer requests that were mentioned, Lord, with Brother Bob and Miss Sharon as they go through um, this road of recovery. Uh, be with their family members around them to give them strength, allow them to provide um, the services that are needed, God. Uh, continue to be with those on the front lines, as Pastor Phil mentioned, and just give them strength, endurance, love, and patience to show their patience, Lord, day in and day out, Lord. Oftentimes they may be tired, but we can trust in you um, and providing them that strength that they need to feel comfort. Thank you for your son, Jesus, the reason that we're here, to celebrate his resurrection, God. And all that he's done for us, the pain that he took on the cross so that we can have this open line of communication with you and this relationship with you, God. Just open our hearts, our ears, and our minds to this morning message. Allow us to soak it in and absorb it, to apply it to our lives. Not just this hour, but the hours to come after this, God. Thank you for your consistent love, your mercy for us, day in and day out. It's your name that we pray. Amen.
and from the fear of humility. Thank you, Jamie. What a powerful thought that the Lord provides all of our needs and takes care of us in a way that only, only a true shepherd could. And uh, well, we've just been blessed with the music today, and, and we're so glad that you've joined us. You know, I've, I've been trying to think about just what this has been doing to us, not just as people, as humans, but as believers in Christ. And, you know, uh, as we, as we navigate these days, there's, there's many things um, that cause us to, to tremble and many things that have caused us to, to kind of be uncertain. And uh, I was reminded of um, a story I heard about uh, a guy who had been to the bottom of the sea and he was telling about what he saw when he came back to his friends and he asked him, he said, do you know what sits at the bottom of the sea and trembles? And, and they said, no, we don't. And he said, a nervous wreck. So I hope as you are listening today that you're not a nervous wreck. Um, today we want to talk about, our series is The Time Is Now. And uh, today we want to talk about dealing with disappointment. Dealing with disappointment. The time is now to deal with disappointment. Let me frame this. Before we get into our introduction, I'll let you get turning to where we're going to be this morning. We're going to be right where that song came from, Psalm 23. So if you turn to the 23rd Psalm, uh, that's where we're going to be this morning. And we're going to read the heart and words of David to talk about dealing with disappointment. But the question I've been asked the most in the last two weeks is this, and you may be able to guess it. Pastor, when are we going to begin gathering in person again? And that is a great question, and I think for every believer, that's on our mind, and we're wondering, when is that going to happen? And the answer I have to give everybody is, I'm not sure yet. Um, we're waiting on what the authorities say. We're also listening to legal advice from Christian lawyers. Different Christian law associations and groups around the country are kind of informing churches to kind of keep us on the up and up. And we're prayerfully considering also the health and safety of the people that will be attending. And so we have all these moving parts <clears throat> that we have to be mindful of as leadership in the church. And so we're just really not sure yet. We've talked about some things that we may be able to do depending on the number that they allow to come back at, at certain times. And, and really, it just it's a question mark right now. And uh, I realize, I realize this has caused a lot of disappointment for, for many, including myself. Um, every time I see a church person delivering something to them or talk to them on the phone or on a Zoom or whatever, the, the question is, when are we going to? I understand, and I'm disappointed too. I wish we could gather in person soon. Uh, and I think we're, dis we're sensing some disappointment because we all hoped that we would have been gathering by now or at least closer to it. Um, but, you know, that's just one of the things we're disappointed about. There's been many things over the last two months that people, 
that have brought disappointment into lives. Um, think about some of these things. Trips and vacations have been canceled because no one's sure what's going to happen in the next few months. Um, spring sports have been canceled, and especially for those young people who have uh, you know, worked all year and their whole career, so to speak, those who are seniors, you know, they, get, they have to miss out on their, their senior year of sports. That's disappointing. Graduations are being canceled. Young people who have worked, you know, for 13 years to get their diploma, and then, you know, uh, adults who have worked in college to get a degree, um, those graduations are being canceled, or at least is not uh, have as much of the pomp, pomp and circumstance as they typically would. That's disappointing. Um, weddings have been postponed indefinitely, or uh, they're, they're taking place with no attendees. That's disappointing. It's a celebration that you want to enjoy with everyone, and it's just not possible right now. And then, as we said, there's still no concrete plans for when we can gather at church again. And, and here's the thing, we're not even sure what that will look like when we can. Um, and so, a lot of disappointment, I think, is settling in in our hearts um, recently. And that is one unavoidable aspect of this life is disappointment. Disappointment means that our expectations were not met. That's what disappointment is. It's we had a plan, we, we expected one thing, and we got something not as good as what we thought we were going to get. That's a disappointment. And the only place we won't experience disappointment, friend, you know, for those of us who know Christ, is heaven. That's the only place where we won't experience disappointment. But while we're here, and while outcomes will not always be what we desire or expect, we can manage disappointment without that disappointment turning into despair. It's okay to just say, okay, I'm disappointed in that. It's another thing for, to allow that disappointment to put us into a spiral downward, into despair, and even sometimes depression. So how can we battle that? Well, I think one thing that we have to do from the beginning as God's people, as Christians, is we have to change the definition of what we call a perfect outcome. We have to change that definition. Probably you and I would define a perfect outcome as things going exactly as we planned or expected. We make plans, we, we, uh, we have expectations for things, and when they happen just as we planned, we say everything went perfect, or we say it went off without a hitch, and we're happy, and, and we have that relief and that success that everything happened as we planned. But I think for us to get through disappointments in life, one thing we have to learn as we grow is we have to manage that by changing what we call a perfect outcome. We begin to crumble when things don't go as planned. And, and it reminds us that you and I make plans, but God makes decisions. And that's just a fact of this life. We make plans. In fact, we make plans for things like, I want to see my children graduate, or I want to see my grandchildren, or I want to see retirement, you know, and we have all these plans and expectations, and when they don't happen, it throws us off, and we're reminded in those moments that while we make plans, God makes decisions, but we can avoid despair and bitterness if we change our definition of the perfect outcome, so what if, what if we viewed the perfect ending to any circumstance as, hear this, our God being positively revealed to the people around us. Now, I know that in our little bubble, in our little world, that loses some excitement, and that's sad. It's sad that Christian people would say, really, that's what we're going to call a positive outcome or the best possible outcome is that our God is revealed positively to the people around us? What about my plans? Well, that's going to bring disappointment and despair if all we care about is what I want. But as God's people, there should be something in us that desires more that God is lifted up and magnified 
positively and properly to those around us no matter what happens in our situation. I thought about this week some people in the Bible who dealt with disappointment. And I think we can learn from how they dealt with it. First of all, Abraham. Here's a guy who uh, didn't have a son that he was promised with Sarah in their time frame. And they were disappointed. And their disappointment led to poor decisions. They, they didn't let God handle that. They weren't so concerned with God being glorified as they were as getting their expected result. <clears throat> I think about Joseph spending years in prison for a situation in which he was innocent. You want to talk about disappointment. One thing after another, this guy's life continues to seemingly spiral downward into despair, into utter just, I give up, but he never did. He always had a proper attitude. He always saw that God was with him, and, and his desire was that in, in everything that he did, his God would be glorified. What about Moses? Boy, disappointment. Forty years in a desert. Then he gets called in to lead God's people out of slavery, and he does that through the power of God. And then they wander for 40 years because the people were unbelieving. And basically, he put up with these unbelieving people until the last person in that generation died. And Moses wasn't even allowed to go into the promised land because when they were griping and complaining about water, instead of speaking to the rock, he hit it twice and said, why are you asking for us to give you water instead of giving God the glory for it? And he did all of that and never got to go in. It's disappointing. The, the last person I thought of and who we're going to talk about today is David. Remember, he was anointed as king, and he had to wait years while being chased by the current king who wanted him dead for no fault of his own, David faced a lot of disappointment. And disappointment is one unavoidable aspect of this life. And so what we have to do is change our definition of the perfect outcome, and that is this, that our God is positively and properly revealed to the people around us. If that takes place, then everything was a success. Are we willing to change our definition of a perfect outcome? Because it will diminish disappointment in our life. Is God going to be glorified in this situation? And if he is, success. No matter what else happened. I know that's tough. I know that goes against our selfish desires. But listen, when we live for the glory of God, uh, and that he is known to all the people around us properly, that changes, that changes a lot of things for us. And, and, and disappointment will will go down in our lives, and despair and depression will go down as we see our God lifted up. And so today we're going to look at David, and particularly <clears throat> one of our favorite psalms, the 23rd Psalm. Let's read this together this morning. Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Thank you, Lord, for this word this morning. Let's go to him in prayer. Our Father, we thank you for this word to our hearts and our souls in this time. And Lord, I know, I know that we're all sensing some sort of disappointment. And, and uh, 
expectations aren't being met and hopes are falling short and plans are being uh, ripped out from underneath us. And Lord, in this hour of possible disappointment and despair, I ask that you would just get a hold of our hearts, Lord, and, and help us to look to you. And, and God, encourage us to remember the blessings that we have because of your leading and your authority in our life and the fact that you are our Father and we are your children and we will never do without because of your goodness and your mercy. God, let this morning be a morning of renewal, of refreshment, that you would restore our souls this morning, please. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So David understood disappointment. Let's think about a couple of the things this guy went through. He, he was anointed by Samuel to be the king of Israel, but he waited, get this, somewhere between 15 and 20 years before he actually became the king. You are anointed, you're told you're going to be the king of Israel, and you have to wait two decades before it actually takes place. While he was waiting, we know all the crazy things that happened. He was the hero of Israel. Remember when he killed Goliath? When nobody else in Israel would stand up to the giant, David said, I will. And he went out and he defeated the giant and the power of the Lord. Not even King Saul was willing to go fight the giant. And yet David, being the hero, was being chased and hunted down by King Saul, trying to have David killed because he was jealous of David. David took, a, took another man's life and took another man's wife. And, and he, he had a child with that woman, and, and just soon after that birth, the child died. These are great disappointments. And later on, David's own son even tried to kill him. I mean, David understood disappointment. He's human just like you and I are. But we get snapshots from the Word of God of David's life that show us how he dealt with these disappointing times. I can imagine there were days when David thought or said, God, it wasn't supposed to happen like this. Or, God, I, I never imagined this would be the outcome. There were times, we know from Scripture, where David wondered, God, how long are you going to allow those who are hunting me to persist? He asked the why question in his heart in many songs and many times. But David set a good example for us by letting, listen, letting God and time answer the why question. Sometimes we have to just sit back and say, okay, Lord, I don't get this, but I'm going to trust you with it, and I'm going to let you and time answer the questions that I have. And this will help lower our disappointment and despair in our lives. Even in times like this, when we say, I just don't get it. Why can't we? Why can't I? Why didn't this go as I planned? If we take a step back and say, okay, Lord, I'm going to let you and time answer these questions because he is ultimately going to get it right. And so, uh, believe it or not, this beloved psalm, the 23rd psalm, can help us properly and realistically manage expectations in our life. Let's, let's uh, journey through this passage together and see what, what the Lord has to say to our hearts this morning. First of all, Psalm 23, verse 1. Everybody knows this. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. The Lord is my shepherd. Let me ask you a question, friend, that's watching this morning. Does the statement, the Lord is my shepherd, bring comfort to you? Does that immediately cause you to be calm? Does that immediately bring a peace to your soul that says, Wait, God's watching over me. God is providing for me. God is protecting. Does that bring comfort to you right now? 
And I would say that if it does not, we're trying to take control from God or we're lending out God's control to others. And, and the fact that God's comfort, that his control in our life doesn't comfort us says a lot about where our heart is. So let's, let's investigate our, our hearts this morning. Is God as shepherd comforting to you? Does it bring any level of comfort? If it does, why? If it does not, maybe spend some time this week praying to the Lord and searching your heart and figuring out why that doesn't comfort you. Because it ought to comfort a child of God to know that he is our shepherd. David's words immediately put us in proper view of our type of order that we have with God. Let's review. He's creator. We are his creation. He's the supreme authority we are free agents with limited ability. He holds all things in his control. We are subject to his sovereignty. He is the shepherd and we are the sheep. And I, I think, friends, that sometimes we need to be reminded that he's the shepherd and we are the sheep. He's not our co-pilot. He's almighty God. And this means that we must have total dependence on him or else we will experience disappointment throughout our lives. This thought comforts some and makes others uncomfortable. God is our shepherd. He's our protector and provider. And it goes on to say in verse 1 that we will not want, we shall not want because we will always be provided for. Now, do you understand that if that statement is true, if I shall not want, that removes disappointment out of the picture. If I'm going to be taken care of by God, disappointment has to go on the back burner. It gives us the right perspective in life. Let me ask you a question, friend. Do you see God as your provider and your protector? Reminder from verse 1. We can totally depend on God and we can totally depend on God to get it right every time. Verse 2 goes on. And in this we see that he provides good things. God provides good things. It says, He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. The, that word green and that word still are, are describing words. He's not just leading us to a pasture. He's leading us to a green pasture. He's not just leading us to water. He's leading us to still waters. And these are important words. First it says he makes us lie down in green pastures. We understand as a sheep, as a, that is food. And it's a place of comfort and rest. And you can look around you and see that there's plenty. Green tells us there's plenty. And the Bible says that your shepherd makes you, he puts you in green pastures. There is plenty of God's provision for you. And friend, I hope in a time like this, that would bring some comfort to you. It says that he leads us beside still waters. Waters quench our thirst. Still waters, doesn't that just make, make you feel calm as soon as you hear those words, still waters? You can look at a stream and you have all kinds of water. You have lakes, you have oceans, you have rivers. And in those rivers, sometimes they're, they're flowing and they're just roaring and raging. And other times you come, apart, you come to a part of a river where it's just slowly going on by. And it's just a serene, calm scene. And the picture that we get here is that our God brings peace. That his presence, he's going to take us to peaceful places. Watch. And there'll be no ambushes. You know, it's important that you're around still waters because if you're in a, a raging river, it's loud and, and someone or something could sneak up on you. But at still waters, you can drink freely and not have to worry about an ambush. You see, this is the care of our God. Those, water, those words are in there for a reason. Green pastures, there's plenty of good stuff. And Still waters, there's good, quality, safe provision. 
from our God. And let's bring comfort, friend. Don't forget what you have. Remember, disappointment means expectations of ours were not meant, were not met. And we need to be reminded of what we have and be thankful for it. Be grateful for what we have in God. Do you thank Him for His good things that He provides you? When was the last time that you took time to list out things you're thankful for? That will help with disappointment. The third thing we see in this passage is in verse 3, and it's that He refreshes us. He says, He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for His name's sake. There's so much here, but we see His refreshing of His sheep. He restores my soul. Let me ask you a question, friend. What else in this world, listen carefully, what else in this world refreshes your soul? What is it that you can actually get soul refreshment from? I know some people are thinking, man, Mountain Dew or, you know, KFC or, or you know, that soul. Like, I understand that refreshes our body and, and that makes us feel good. But I'm talking about soul refreshment. What else in this world actually refreshes us? Nothing but God. He refreshes our soul. He restores us. He leads us in the path of right living. You see that? He leads us in the path of righteousness. He, he makes us right with God. And, and because of his life and ours, we can have right living. Why does he do that? Well, it says, for his name's sake. And, and here's the key. You ready? If you want to unlock the door to dealing with disappointment. Are you disappointed, friend? Are you disappointed this morning? Well, this will help you to unlock that key and to break through your disappointment. Here it is. What we mentioned at the beginning is we have to change our definition of the perfect outcome. The perfect result in any circumstance is God being properly and positively revealed to the people around us. Why does he do what he does for us? For his name's sake. It's for his glory. If I live for my glory, there's going to be plenty of disappointment. If I live for his glory, it changes everything. You know, we become too selfish. And when our life is all about us, it can lead to despair. In fact, it often does. But when your life becomes about God's glory, disappointment greatly decreases. I wonder, friend, what is it that's disappointed you lately? Is it a missed trip? We got news this week that our flights were canceled for Grace's senior trip. That's disappointing. But we have to take a step back and say, okay, look at what we have. There'll be another time. There'll be another trip. We have to just step outside of it and say, okay, Lord, what is it during this time? How is my response to this going to reflect you? That's just one example. You probably have your own of disappointments in these days. How is our response going to reflect God? Are you truly refreshed by your Lord? Let me ask, when was the last time you sat down with his word and in prayer, and you stood up from that time refreshed. This is what he does for us when we allow it. The fourth thing we see in this passage in verse 4 <clears throat> is that he comforts us in dire moments. God comforts us in dire moments. This, this passage takes a little bit of a turn here, and it says, Yes, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death... So there's an expectation. Yes, I'm going to walk through valleys. And these valleys aren't pretty valleys. <clears throat> They're valleys that have the shadow of death. A valley is a disappointment. We talk about mountaintop experiences being exciting, wonderful things, and valleys being low things. A valley is a disappointment. And he says, yes, I'm going to walk through valleys. That's a part of it. 
He says, I'm going to walk through valleys, even in the shadow of death. What does the shadow do? It resembles something. It's not death, because as a believer in Christ, uh, we have eternal life. But he says, I'm walking through this shadow of death. A shadow is something that resembles something. And so he says, this valley that we walk through resembles the end. Isn't that what disappointment does? Oh, it didn't happen. This is the worst. It's over. That's our initial reaction. Disney's going to be closed forever. You know, no. They're never going to open up my favorite restaurant again. No. You know, our initial reaction is just despair. And he says, wait, it's the shadow of death. And this life is shadowy that way. It's just shadow. And he says, yeah, we're going to walk through it. We're going to walk through it. But notice, I love these words. Pay attention to the words. Verse 4. Yea, though I walk through. He didn't bring us there to keep us there. Um, Disappointments come and go. Valleys come and go. The shadows come and go. Yea, though I walk through the valley. What does it say? This is awesome, isn't it? I will fear no evil. Why not? Because you're with me. Let me ask you, friend, is that enough for you? Is that enough? Is God's presence in your life enough? We surround ourselves with all kinds of, here's a big word, accoutrements, peripherals, fancy things, extras to make us feel good, to to give us happiness. We, 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 we infiltrate our lives with these things to make up for something else. And as a believer in Jesus, why isn't it enough that he is with us? Why is it that we have to have everything the way that we expect it and planned it? Why isn't it enough? And David said, look, even though I'm going through the valley of the shadow, it's okay because you're with me. Do you really feel that way? Do I really feel that way when I'm going through the valley of the shadow? That's convicting. It's convicting. <clears throat> Let me ask this. Do you sense his presence in the valleys and shadows of your life? Even David says that his gentle leadership and his discipline are comforting. His discipline and His discipline and his gentle leadership, even that is comforting. Did you see that in verse number four? He says, you're with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. We mentioned that a couple weeks ago. That staff was for guiding sheep away from danger. The rod was for breaking their legs so that they would be carried by by the shepherd so that they could no longer wander off. And both, David says, are a comfort. Do you view God's leadership as offensive? When you make plans, but he makes decisions, does that offend you? Do you view his his discipline as hatred toward you? David did. He said, this is wonderful. The fact that you gently lead me, and yeah, even the fact that you discipline me, that's comforting. You know why? Why? Because you're there. (laughs) Because you're there. Because you're around. Because you're with me. These things are comforting. Is he enough for you? Verse 5, we see the fifth thing here. That God gives us a bright future. God gives us a bright future. Look at verse 5. David says, Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. You know, God did that for David, didn't he? Right in front of his enemies, God prepared this wonderful table as king for, for him. He, he, think about, go in David's mind, when he was anointed uh, by Samuel, God prepared a table before him in the presence of his enemies. King Saul knew that David was going to be king. All of the surrounding nations who heard that David defeated Goliath knew that David was next king, and God said in the presence of all their enemies, this 
is the guy and through, through whom I am going to work. He did that for David. Did you know that Christ is doing this for you if you're a Christian? God is in you and working through you even in the presence of your enemy. What a miracle. And then he says, um, you anoint my head with oil. God did that for David, literally. He anointed him as king. As a Christian, Christ does this for you when he gives you his Holy Spirit at the moment of salvation. You are anointed with his Holy Spirit. He pours him out, the Bible says, on us. And his, his love is shed abroad in our hearts. We've been given this blessed gift of the Holy Spirit. And then he says these words, my cup runs over. David had much joy in victories and in worship, didn't he? In fact, one of his, his, his wife got mad at him because he was worshiping the Lord. And she despised him because he was dancing before the Lord. And she said, I don't even like it. Look, he was worshiping his Lord. David had much joy in his heart in worship and in victory. Let me ask you a question, friend. Do you? Do you enjoy the victories of God in your life? When, you, when God does something victorious in your life, do you celebrate it? We celebrate everything. Last night we had a bonfire. Backyard. Got a new fire pit. Had to try it out. We invited our neighbors over. And uh, we had, we were all six feet apart-ish. And uh, we were enjoying that fire. And our other neighbor came out and he's, he had his family over and he says, what are you celebrating? And, and Tim said, warm weather. <laughs> you know, we, we celebrate anything, man, you know. You know, we had marshmallows and chocolate and graham crackers, amen, right? That's a celebration. We celebrate a lot, but I'm, I want to say this. Do we celebrate the victories of God in our lives? Do we, do we have joy, like David, do we have joy in worship? Do we have joy in worship? I mean, this morning when we were singing these praises, the people in the room, <laughs> tears coming down our faces. I mean, I was about to come off the drum kit, you know. Do we have joy in our worship? David did, and, and this helps just get us out of the depths of despair and disappointment when we realize who our God is and what he has done for us in verse 5. And we close our thought this morning in verse 6. He says, surely... Goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. Don't you love how, how uh, sure, confident that David is here? Why, how can you be so confident? He says, without a doubt, surely, without a doubt, mercy and goodness are going to follow me. Listen, God provides mercy and goodness every day. Isn't that what he said? All the days of my life. Even through the last two months, God has provided mercy and God has provided goodness. It's just will we see it. Without a doubt, David says, I know my God, my shepherd is so good that every day of my life there's going to be mercy and there's going to be goodness. Aren't we reminded of Lamentations 3, 22 and 23? You can put it up on the screen there. It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. Every morning, Jeremiah said, David said it's going to follow me every day of my life. His mercy and his goodness. Let me ask you a question, friend. Do you see his mercy today? When you woke up, did you see mercy of God in your life? Do you look for his goodness today? Have you seen God do something good even already today? Boy, I have. As soon as I woke up and my alarm clock startled me out of sleep and I almost stepped on my dog, I immediately thought, Lord, thank you for another day. Thank you for the health to get up and <laughs> to walk over to the alarm clock. And thank you, thank you, Lord, that it's your day and we're going to go to church in a little bit. I'm telling you. 
his mercy and his goodness is a daily thing. And he finishes by saying, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. That has a new meaning for Christians, doesn't it? Because we will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. We have a bright future. And even, in the, even, as, we, even as we have to take a step back and say, yes, our future is awesome, and we live here in this kind of shadowy valley place, his mercy and goodness is there every day. So let's ask these questions. Do you look for his mercies every day, or do you look for something else? Do you look for what's gone wrong? Turn off the news and look at his mercy. Turn off the news and look at his goodness. Turn off the news and remember that you will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I want to challenge us. I want to challenge us. For those of you who like to write things down, use a pen and paper. For those of you that like to type them down, use your phone. Here's a challenge for this week and maybe, maybe going forward. What if every day we made a goodness and mercy list and we wrote down one good thing that God did and one way that God showed you mercy in that day? Maybe you do it in the morning, maybe you do it at the end of the day or as it happens, doesn't matter. Write it down and you'll watch. You know what we're going to watch? We're going to watch how goodness and mercy followed us every day. And that will help pull us out of despair and disappointment. And please, by all means, every day, remind yourself that you're going to spend eternity with the Lord. It will help you. And this will help diminish disappointment. We're going to invite Sandy to come now to uh, play a song as we have our time of reflection. Let's begin viewing the perfect ending of any circumstance, the perfect outcome of any circumstance of our life as being that we properly reflected God to those around us. Did I properly reflect God in my attitude and what I said and how I treated others? That is success. It, it, whether or not my plans came through like I planned them and my expectations were met, okay, great or not great, but how did I handle it? Did the people around me see my God in a positive way and in the proper way? Let's change our definition together. Maybe you're watching this morning and you're not even sure that you will. Like David said, I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Maybe you're watching today and you say, I really don't know if I'm going to spend eternity in heaven. The good news is that Jesus came to this earth. God became a man. He lived a perfect life, never one time sinned. He died on the cross for the sins of you and me and the whole world. He was buried Three days later, he rose from the dead to conquer death, to conquer hell, to conquer the grave, so that you and I, anybody the Bible says, believes on him, can have eternal life. Will you trust him today? Eternal life can be yours. A home in heaven can be yours if you'll simply put your faith in Christ. The Bible says that we believe in our hearts. Friend, do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God who died for you and rose again. Do you believe that? If you do, are you willing to ask him to save you? The Bible says with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. Would you confess to the Lord that you believe this right now? If you wouldn't even know how to begin that, you could just pray for him in your heart. Ask the Lord to save you. Lord, I believe. I trust you. And I'm going to lead a prayer now if, you, if you're... If you want to be led in a prayer, and remember, it's not any magic words. There's nothing that you can say. It's, it's from your heart. The faith in your heart what causes you to confess out of your mouth. Here's a prayer that you could pray if you want to trust Jesus right now. You could say, Dear Jesus, to the best of my understanding, I confess to you that I am a sinner. And I need a Savior. I know you're my only hope. I'm placing my faith in your death, burial, and resurrection. Your finished work. You paid for my sins. 
And I'm trusting you right now as my Savior.